I don't know what the price of Bitcoin is. You don't know. But some of these people out there are saying it could go to 100,000, 150,000, 200,000 in the next 18 months. If it reaches those targets, you know, the, the, the hodlers are going to win the game. In the world of Bitcoin mining analysis, there are a couple of voices. And one of the lead voices is the guest today. Anthony Power is the co-founder of Power Mining Analysis, joins us today to talk about all things Bitcoin mining and a deep analysis of Bitcoin mining stocks and the publicly traded companies in the United States. Anthony, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you for hopping on. I want to just dive right in. And you are you do a lot of podcasts, right? A lot of people hear from you every single week, whether it's with McNally Money and the Power Mining Analysis, or you're being invited on as a guest. And I want to go all the way back to your origins and just briefly talk about your past before Bitcoin mining and how it really lends, you know, how those skills really lend to you being an amazing Bitcoin mining analysis today. Um, no, th thank you for the, for the compliment. Um, for those that don't know my background, um, I joined the military, uh, the British Army in 1984 at the ripe age of 17 years old. The, the unemployment in the UK at that time was, was over 3 million. We had Margaret Thatcher as the prime minister. And uh, it was times where there was, there was real challenges. There was not many jobs available and the wages that they're offering for those jobs was not, was not anywhere um, you know, significant. The army offered an opportunity for young men um, to join up um, and, and get a reasonable salary. And also, um, I didn't get many qualifications from school, uh, get, get some sort of education, some sort of trade. And I signed for three years and I ended up staying in for 25 years. So during that time, I spent the majority of it working in finance. I qualified as a chartered accountant in the military. So by the time I was uh, nearly 30, I qualified as a chartered accountant. And for my last 12 year service, I was effectively posted to big organizations doing big uh, management accounting projects. Um, and you know, an example of those projects could be uh, during that during that last twelve years, we had the sort of the conflicts in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and um, you know we would send accountants out to those locations ahead of the uh, the units, and they would go out there and look at the, the potential for sites to be built, how much that would cost, what resources would be required, and work with those advanced parties to determine that, and then come back to the UK draw up the the plans with the planners and those will be put into place so it's not a case of we you know everything is done in a, in a in a in a in a planned way when you're going to be in a in a location for a significant amount of time yes you can go into locations for you know when something immediate happens for a short period but if you're going to be in a country for you know 10 15 years you're going to want some sort of facilities that are going to be fit for purpose and so you know at the, at the front of that you know they have accountants and I look at the trades in the military. It's probably the same in, in the US military and other nations around the world. You have literally every type of person required. Every You know, you have your uh, mechanics, you have your chefs, you have your admin people, you have your lo logistics and procurement people. Yes, you have soldiers, you have security, you have IT personnel, you have people that can fly, people that can sell ships. So all these skills... Um, you have within the military. So when it deploys, they're not having to take civilians on deployment. They have all those skills, tailors, um, medics, you know, you, dental, everything is provided within the military. It's one big, one big family. So um, that was, that appealed to me. Um, I enjoyed it. I did 17 postings in my 25 years. So you do get moved around quite a lot. It's a, it's, it's sometimes quite a challenge for the families, not as much for the soldier themselves, because they are tuned into taking orders, going to locations and starting a new job in a, in a, in a family that they become part of on day one. So there's none of this like going to a new job and you don't know, you know how you're going to fit in. You fit in every new unit on day one. You're part of that family. But, but your own personal family have to carry, you know, that, that going to a new place for the first time, children going to a new school, Wives having to refind a job, sometimes not in the employment they'd like to do. If it's overseas, there might not be a lot of uh, jobs. If you go to Germany, can you speak the language? Exactly, you know. So, so 
there are a lot, a lot of challenges for the family, but for themselves and themselves, it's you know, it's just a job. Job is place to place. It's the same job. So I did that till I was forty two. Came out of the military, and um, I went to the one of the largest employers in the world, which is the National Health Service in the UK. So we have our own National Health Service, and at the moment, I think there's something like you know. Between one and a half and two million people are employed by the National Health Service in the UK. So, you know, there's only, if I remember rightly, I'm going to say the Chinese Army, the Indian Railway and Amazon are the three biggest employers ahead of the National Health Service. And if that's still the same, it's probably, it probably and it's probably true, it's, it's probably still there. Um, so I worked for them for a few years. Then I got an opportunity to go and work in a country called Kazakhstan. Um, in the oil and gas sector. So I went to work for a, a big Australian uh, mining company called um, Whirly Parsons. I spent three years in Kazakhstan. I met my wife in Kazakhstan. I came back to the UK, did a few more years in the NHS, and then I retired um, on reaching the age of 50. I'd done everything I needed to do, had my army pension, and I was able to manage with that there. And I was enjoying traveling around, and then this thing called COVID happened. And um, the travelling stopped. I was actually in the Far East. I was in uh, Thailand when the UK went into lockdown. So I got had problems getting back from Thailand. My flights got delayed. And so I eventually got back to the UK, spent the next two years like everybody else did, playing by the rules, you know, literally staying in my apartment, doing my one visit to the shops per week. And I used to go at seven in the morning because I didn't want to come into contact with anybody. Um, and I do a you know a couple of sessions a week, um, you know, uh, just just have a walk around the, the the local area again, trying to do it when not many people are around, just to get some exercise. Um, and I just I got bored towards the end of it, and I'm like, oh, what do I do? So I started looking at um, just I was doing some investments, and it was really all the sort of safe stocks, you know, banking stocks, supermarkets. I think I invested in AstraZeneca as well, which were the ones, one of the ones that providing the, uh, the, 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 the jabs for the, the COVID jab. So I thought that might be an interesting one to do. And it, and it, was, a, it was a good speculation. And then this one day, I um, bought a company called Marathon Digital, and it was like a few dollars a share. And I, 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 I think I bought a thousand shares, something like that. And within about four weeks, the, 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 the investment had like quadrupled. And I'm like, I'm scratching my head. These other companies I'd bought were like for a year, five or six percent. And I bought this company and it was like, you know, 400 percent up in the space of a month. And I'm like, what have I bought? I don't even know what I'm, you know, my wife said to me something about Bitcoin before that. And I said, no, it's a scam. Don't, you know, don't invest in Bitcoin. It's volatile. It's up one day, down the next day. That's not that's not where you want to be. Someone will find out in the end it's a scam and it's like, you know, it's a, some sort of scheme and we're all, it'll all be fixed, like, you know. And, and uh, but what what this Marathon Digital Company made me do was actually start looking into what they physically did in terms of doing a bit. And, it, and so they mined, you know, they mined the Bitcoin and that was about as much as it, as it did. And to be honest with you, I think a lot of retail investors probably don't know as much more than that, really. But I started to, from an accounting perspective, look at what the company did, started looking at their reports. They were one of the smallest miners. I'm thinking even, even when I bought Marathon Digital, they were smaller than Argo blockchain. So that's going back a few years. Um, and look at the difference now. You've got Marathon Digital at 5 billion. You've got Argo blockchain at 85 million today. So, um, you know, Marathon's grown 60 times bigger than, than Argo has in, in the space of the last three and a half years. And that can happen to miners in this space. But... Um, it got me. It got me looking at. Um, it got me thirsty for more knowledge. And um, at the time, there was a. I come from the UK, so there was a guy in Germany called Blonity, and he was doing some really good analysis. This guy was an energy expert, so I'm an accountant. This guy was an energy expert, and he was doing these updates with regularity. And he was doing some podcasts, and he hid his face and he wanted to keep. Um, a ton, you know, you know, an anon an anonymity and. Um, and so, you know, but he had a, he had a real good following. He did have a really good following. And he'd been in the space since about 2018, 2019. He bought Hive, um, Hive Digital and Hut8 when they were sort of like fairly new miners. And they're the two oldest miners of all the public miners. So, you know, that's how long ago he was in there. So he was doing his analysis. And I sort of started doing some numbers at the start of 2021. 
Um, and he actually reached out to me and said, look, I'd like to work with you and um, we could do something together. And I was, I was really keen and um, we started to talk about it. And then for some reason, he, he just left the space. I think the Bitcoin price has started to drop and he found it wasn't for him. And I'd been doing my monthly updates for probably about five or six months by this stage. And he, he was using my updates in his um, updates as well. So he was saying, here's Anthony's tables. And then he was talking through my tables on his on his podcast. And I quite liked it because it's, you know, it's nice to get some recognition from somebody that a lot of people were following. You know, he had a, he had a really good audience. And um, it got me thinking, you know, I can probably... You know, he's gone. I'll probably carry on doing it myself. And I started to increase. So at the start, when I started doing it, I think it was like five or six miners. I think I had Argo Blockchain, uh, Hot8, Hive Digital, Riot Platforms, Marathon Digital, and Bitfarms. Those were the sort of six miners that I did. And and and, and that was for quite some time. And then it it started to grow, and I did the likes of Clean Spark when they came online, you know, just over a couple of years ago. And the last sort of... 12 months, 15 months, it's grown now. I think probably 14, 15, 16 miners on some, you know, in some months I'm covering. It's a lot, it's a lot to cover. Um, but it's not, fortunately, it's not just, you know, me now doing everything. I've got a little bit of a team together and we're doing, you know, you rightly say the podcast this year have been a lot. In 2023, I didn't do that many. I probably did about, I'm going to say about 15 or 16, but since January this year, we've done over 50 at least. So we're we're doing we're doing podcasts pretty much most days, um, and and if I'm not doing podcasts with Bryce, um, who's my who's my partner, um, I'm doing podcasts with other people like like yourself. Um, so you know I, I get a lot of invites to do podcasts. I get a, I've started to get a lot of invites to do conferences. So I'm going to be speaking at the the Bitcoin conference in Nashville this year. I was speaking at the Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam last year. Um, I do get to some of the other conferences as well where I can get access to the mining uh, C-suite guys. So I was in London a few weeks ago and 10 of the miners were there. So that was a great opportunity to catch up with these people because I, I write about them on a monthly basis. So it's nice to have face-to-face -face time, find out um, if they you know like what I'm doing at the moment or you know I, I don't I'm not out there to try and get you know the hot tip on on any companies like that I, I I'm I'm not interested if if the if the information's public I'll find the information myself generally and um you'll never see me putting any scoops out about this is the share price where it's going to be I don't do any forward thinking on share prices or bitcoin price I don't know what they're going to be tomorrow you don't know Jarrett and neither does anybody else know so I'm not going to start guessing. And some people like that. They like technical analysis and there's a place for it. But for me, it's fundamentals. I do everything historically, you know, as at today and behind. That's that's where I work from. Um, and, you know, I can talk about growth because if a company says they're going to install, you know, 2000 mining machines next month, of course, I can talk about that because that's that's something they're going to do. And the impact of that will be. So I can talk about that there. But I never... I don't discuss future pricing on anything really because it's not it's not my strength and it's nobody else's strength, you know. But yeah, yeah. Thank you for that intro. And I was looking over the power mining analysis website and I saw Kazakhstan oil and gas. I saw your time in the military, and it seems like your time in the military, looking at site development mixed with your oil and gas history and background is almost setting you up perfectly to kind of understand Bitcoin mining as an industry and. As we talk now more directly about the stocks, because you mentioned that Marathon was the first one that you just happened to buy and then was like, wait, no I need to learn more about this. Um, one of the things I see most when we post your articles on X is everyone in the comments saying, why didn't you include this? You know, no one's ever happy enough, unfortunately, with your analysis because they want more, right? And so I was looking mm. at the hash rate index and they list 24 public miners and normally you're doing 15 to 16. So is that a bandwidth issue or is it almost like, look, there's only 15 or 16 worth talking about this month because they're the ones that are actually doing stuff. They're the ones that are actually investing or making moves that I know about and that they've shared publicly. There's, there, there are a number of constraints. Um, one is the, the time factor to cover 24 miners. And bear in mind, Jarrett, I don't think anybody in the space is doing what I'm doing on a monthly basis. So, you know, to do, even if I'm only covering 50, I think the last article for April was 15 miners. When you're covering 15 miners, and I don't just cover 
what you know what they did in terms of Bitcoin mining. I, I also cover any updates that they've put out in that last 30 days. So it gives people a chance. If they've missed something, I'll have probably covered it in the article. Anything that was key that was happening. So in terms of you know production, in terms of all the metrics I use, I'll write about those. But I'll also input there if they've if there's something that they've done, they've made a big order, they've got a new site, they're merging. I'll include that as well as part of you know article, and I'll put a link to the main you know to to where people can look for a bit more. I've only I'm limited on the amount of words. I mean, you know you you, you know you you know you know I, I I've got a certain amount of words to complete, and 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 I've never written under the amount yet. I've always exceeded the amount on the articles. You know, it's very rare I come in and say I'm I'm actually short this month. And um, they usually probably 10, 15 percent over. Um, and and you know I could I could write probably twice as much. I'm having to cut down to to get it down to the, the number of words and also the time it takes. So putting these articles together, you know that when I send my graphs through to the graphic designers to start putting them getting them ready, uh, you know there's still probably two or three days getting the article finalised and then putting the graphs in the article and the tables in the articles. So there's a lot of work involved in getting to that point. Yes, I'd like to cover 24 miners, but I mean, you know, the, Jacob would have a have a field day trying to get them getting them miners into into one line in terms of, you know, the tables I do. So I think 13, 14, 15 is a, is a nice number. And what 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 I'm going to I have listened to these comments. I do see these comments as well. So what we're going to try and start doing is we're going to sort of start rotating a few miners in maybe. So, you know, um there are a core, core number of miners that I will include in there. Uh, and that's for selfish reasons, but there there are there are some there are a couple of spaces there that can be utilised for miners that can be rotated in and out. So we could show other miners and what they're doing on an ad hoc basis like that, and not include everyone. But um, you know, I have a team of uh, six people that that support me um, doing this, and um, you know, to support that, they need to be paid on a monthly basis. So you know, I have to sort of like try to deliver that there as well. But you know, the the articles um are you know i've been doing the articles now for i think over two years now i think i think i started in april uh 2022 with your predecessor and the the interesting thing was i only signed up for three and i think we're over 70 now so, you know it's been going it's been going really well and a lot of people like the monthly article because it has everything in all the information in there all the metrics in there and like you say there are not many people in the space that that do that level. There's, I think I think uh, you said look said there's 24. There's more than 24. I think there's close to 30 out there. It's a lot of small miners that you know people exactly you know, not really you know notice. I, I've actually included some of the small miners and I've asked that people say this question: Why do you include these small miners? And I'll give you an answer to that one straight away. Two and a half years ago, I was approached by a CEO called Dan Roberts. His company had half an exahash of, um, you know, of, of, of hash, hash rate. They're an Australian company. Um, they are called Iron, right? So they had half a hash rate, exahash two and a half years ago. And he came, he, he reached out to me and said, like, he loved, loved what I'm doing on there. And is there any, any chance, we, you know, Iron could be part of the group? And I went, absolutely. All I need you to do is, and this applies to, you know, the reason, again, why, the, why I don't include everyone is, um, you know, People don't submit monthly monthly updates. So, you know, you show me the last time Galaxy submitted a monthly update. They don't submit monthly updates in the mining. Well, do you know how many Bitcoin Galaxy mine? We, we know when it gets to the quarterly update because they have to they have to announce it. But nobody knows what they do monthly. So I can't include a company like that in my month. And people say, why don't you include Galaxy? You know, um, but uh, I remember half an extra hash back in, I think, November, December 2021. And I started to include them, I think from January, I think we, we started from the new year. And yes, I've got some miners now that are about the same size. But who knows in two years what those miners could be? You know, so, you know, everyone, everyone knows what the, who the big miners are. You know, Argo Blockchain were one of the biggest miners in 2021. Um, you know, I don't include Argo anymore in my, you know, in my updates. They, they've, they've dropped off, you know, you you make allowances. They were, in, uh, I think, I covered them for about eighteen months, nearly two years. I don't, I don't cover them now. I actually reached out to Argo, and 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 they didn't really want to be part. I think that you know they've got enough issues on their on their plate to try and sort out where they're going. They've just, they've just announced their results today. 
and um, you know the challenge will be the next quarter now because they've just I think they've got the head above water um, in terms of what they delivered. But um, yeah, I get, I, get, I, I do get you know, and I reached out to Cipher uh, to Tyler Page at Cipher Mining, and, that, and and his response to me was, well, we're, we're you know we like to we we're quite happy to to be quiet and we don't want to you know, and you know, and I'm thinking fine, I'll I'll I'll, I'll support that you know, I'm not interested in being part of the group, that's fine. Um, but there's an expectation out there that people just want me to spend 60 hours a week doing everything for free. And, and it just, you know, it certain can't, you know, it can't happen that way. So, you know, we're trying to build a product. It doesn't mean that, you know, we, we don't cover, we cover, we still cover a lot of other information about miners. I still cover in my podcasts uh, about miners that, you know, that aren't part of power mining analysis. So there's a, there's a, it's still a lot out there, but again, it goes down to, if they're providing regular updates and information that retail investors would want to see, then they can be part of the group. If they don't, I can't. I can't make the numbers up. So you know that's that's the challenge with a lot of miners. And people have said to me, amount of times they come out with a miner's name, and I said, please send me their update. And he goes, well, they haven't done one for three months. And that's the reason they're not in. Uh, you know, I can't. I, 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 you know, I've I've reached out to some miners saying, why don't you put an update out? And I don't. I didn't get a response. So. Um, as I say, that the 15, 16 that I do cover are regular regular miners who put them out every month. They put them out every month, and and I've got them now to a point where um, these results are out in the sort of first six, seven days. Two years ago, some of them were taking 12, 13 days to get their numbers out. But I just said to them, I said, look, if you can get it out in the first six, seven days, they'll be in the article. And it, believe you me, they want to be in the article. They want to be part of the group. They want to be in that table. Whether they come first or last, they want to be in the, they want to be part of the table. So, um, you know, and if you look at what these mining mining companies provide now compared to what they provided three years ago, three years ago these mining companies would say, "A plus production, we mined fifty bitcoin. Our hash rate is one extra hash. Our cost of uh, not even that, our hodl is twenty five bitcoin. Full stop. That was it. Two lines. Now." If you look at what the mines produce now, you're getting extensive information. You're getting two or three pages, four pages. I mean, you know, go and look at Bit Farms, go and look at Riot, go and look at Marathon, go and look at I. They're all doing it. I'm trying to find actually. There's only a couple that that still put the basics, but but 13 or 14 of those miners that I include literally write War and Peace at the end of the month, and they they do. They give a lot of information. The, the landscape's changed. In fact, no, I tell a lie. Three years ago, Peter Wall, who was the CEO of Argo Blockchain, so you know, I, I should be getting, a, I should be getting a check in the post the amount of times I mentioned Argo this this podcast. Um, but Peter Wall was doing this three years ago. What all these CEOs are doing now? He was a he was the uh, the face of Argo Blockchain. He was doing YouTube podcast. He was standing up on a weekly basis. Asking answering Q&A sessions from shareholders, doing everything that, you know, the expectation for these shareholders was was growing. They wanted more information, you know, and having the CEO come on every week and tell you live what was happening, it was great, you know, and nobody else would do it. And then all of a sudden, things happen at Argo, Peter's not there anymore. And so we went through the bear cycle. You didn't hear from any miners in the bear cycle. They're all sort of, you know, still trying to work out the, the, the strategy out of the bear cycle. Now we've seen this sort of green shoots over the last 15 months of the Bitcoin price has risen back from 15,000 back in uh, January 2023 to where it is today, hovering around 69, 70,000. You can't stop getting the miners out there talking about companies, their companies, and they're doing it with regularity. So on spaces now, every week, you will see or hear from uh, four, five, six mining C-suite executives. Yeah. And speaking of spaces, you know, I was on the the space the other night where you were featured and excellent. Yes. And the HODL was brought up. Sam yep. Tabar, who was recently on the Power Mining Analysis, brought up the HODL. If you could speak about the strategy now, as you've just talked about, we went from 15,000 all the way up to 70,000. Let's try to not talk too much about price, but really talk about the strategic value a hodl adds to a miner's arsenal or to a miner's ability to kind of move forward and how you think that's going to continue to play out if bitcoin price continues to kind of go up and to the right over the next 18 months well if, if, if bitcoin price continues to rise and that's the key question is bitcoin price going to continue to rise because when it rises 
every hodler will stand on a box and tell you it's the best strategy. Mm. But those people who were hodling weren't saying that in 2022 when the Bitcoin price dropped in value from 69,000 at its height, at the end of 2021, back down to 15,000. And so all these miners who were selling on a daily basis were, were getting really good rewards during that period there. So there's two strategies. Obviously, one is is the hodl. And you've got five, six, seven companies now out of those 15 miners that I put in my analysis who are hodling and hodling quite a lot in this last few periods. You know, they, they're going to benefit. You could see in their results for Q1, uh, Marathon Digital had a massive, I think it was 500 million unrealized gain in the value of Bitcoin on their balance sheet and in their income statements. So that is a, you know, that's a that's a positive position to their income statement. You know, when they're coming out with this massive um, uh, net income figure, the majority of which is if they took away that, that valuation of Bitcoin, they actually made a loss in Q1, Marathon Digital, but they had this massive unrealized gain. Um, and all the other companies that hodled had this big unrealized gain. And the ones that didn't hodl, sort of had um you know results that you know they were they were they were positive but they were they were just like you know literally above above break even you know um the bitcoin price has to rise has to continue to rise for these to these companies because if it drops below 70,000 and stays below 70 at the end of june those seven companies have to put in losses then in the last 3 months that's how it works so it, it when when it's going up it's great and yes if you know, I don't know what the price of Bitcoin is. You don't know. But some of these people out there are saying it could go to 100,000, 150,000, 200,000 next 18 months. If it reaches those targets, you know, the, the, the hodlers are going to win the game in terms of that, that spot there. I don't believe the market knows how to value them at the moment in terms of having that hodl on the balance sheet. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, you've got the likes of Santa Bar. You've got the likes of Fred Teal. You've got the likes of Jason Les. Um, they can articulate the hodl really, really well. They can. They can articulate to an audience. I've seen them do it. I was in London. In fact, those three were on the same panel in London. And they've got, you know, Bit Digital might be a small miner, but they've got, you know, over $140 million of Ethereum. It might even be high now because Ethereum price has rocketed in the last, last few days with the potential um, e spot ETF uh, for Ethereum being approved. Um, but they've got they've got about 140 million in Bitcoin and ETF on, on their balance sheet. A company that's valued literally about 300 million. And they've got a massive hodl. Um, that price rises. It's you know it's it gives them opportunity to do to do to do more with it. You know they could sell the Bitcoin if they sell at the right time. Bear in mind in twenty twenty two, I can name miners who 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 actually bought Bitcoin and then sold it at a loss. So some miners in twenty twenty two at the start of twenty twenty two bought Bitcoin thinking it's only going to go up, and ended up selling it for half the price they bought it. And I think they were, we're talking like buying a, a thousand coins, not not a small amount. So um, it's it's you know, you look at the people that don't hodl. Listen to Paul Prager. Listen to Dan Roberts. They'll come up with an equal and opposite argument as to as to why they sell on a daily basis, because they're selling the Bitcoin daily basis to grow accretively and to deliver more hash rate and not maybe dilute as much as some of those companies that so when you look at marathon riot clean spark look at the amount of dilution they've they've actually incurred in the last 18 months it's mind-blowing absolute might they've sold the company two three times in the last 18 months now it's been a great strategy to do that and i think some of the other miners now are realizing they should have been doing this doing the same selling you know not maybe not selling the bitcoin but selling shares in the company shareholders don't want dilution no shareholder wants dilution they can't really understand that you know if i sell 100 million shares in the company and raise a billion dollars and put that billion dollars into more facilities get lower energy and, and, and mine more bitcoin i'm going to um benefit from that um they're not they don't they they don't understand it because that's that's too far away from 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 reality all they know is i had my 100 shares are worth less today than they were yesterday because you just diluted the company. And, and, and that, you know, um, I, I think the ATM strategies have been, have been worked really well. And I have, I have um, you know, I've got some shares in Marathon and CleanSpark. And, uh, you know, um, 
If you look at CleanSpark, go back to October last year, CleanSpark were valued at 600 million. They're 4 billion today. So in seven or eight months, they've increased from 600 million to 4 billion. That's been a great, that's been a great move. And in that, in that same period, they've hardly sold any Bitcoin. So they only started hodling towards the end of 2023 really strongly every month, literally um, keeping their whole production. And you know, Riot have done the same last few months. They've not sold any Bitcoin for a few months now. Hive Digital, um, another, you know, what you say now is in, in terms of market cap, a small miner, but, you know, I've got a hodl of 2,400 coins. It's a significant, their hodl is nearly their market capitalization. Hooked eight, their hodl is their market capitalization. So the market, the market are not given a premium to some of these companies for having a huddle. So, you know, the argument then is, and you know, and, and I'll tell you why they're not giving a premium for the, for the, for the um, you know, volatility of Bitcoin price. The market wants to see where you're going to be in three months, six months, nine months, 12 months with, with reassurances. And no miner can say that. Um, what, what they can do, those miners now that have moved into the AI HPC business as part of their remit and you know you're on the podcast there and sam's got a really good argument for this and i i 100 support that argument he's got out there and got a client and delivered a hpc business that's going to give him 50 million of annualized profits we've just seen the first quarter come out the margins after giving 1.3 million back to the company in terms of performance, they, they didn't perform as well in the first few weeks of the contract as they'd agreed to, and they gave a performance fee back to, the, back to their client. They still made 61% margin on that business. Now, that should really start sending a message out there to the institutions because that's real. That's real money. That contract is $4.1, $4.2 million every month. You know it's going to be in April, May, June, all the way to December. No miner can tell you what they're going to earn in Bitcoin tomorrow because they don't know what the price is. They don't know what the difficulty is going to be in two weeks' time. The difficulty, I think, went up today, or it's going up today, having dropped 6%. For the first time post the halving. So it went, you know, everyone was saying in, April, in uh, January this year, Jarrett, the, the difficulty, uh, you know, will, will, will come down significantly post the halving because the rewards will drop by 50% and all these inefficient miners will come off the, off, off, the, off, the, off the global hash rate. And it never happened. It went up. The first difficulty post halving went up by 2%. Then it's dropped by 6%. But because the Bitcoin price is still hovering around that 70,000, it means that potentially some of these less efficient miners that were expected to come off can still make a small profit at that level. And therefore, you know, uh, the, the strategies are probably, you know, keep mining until you don't bring in a contribution. Yeah. One of the things that I think is interesting is the difference between the way maybe retail investors are going to look at a mining stock and try to value a company versus the way Bitcoin miners and you as a Bitcoin mining analyst think about the value of a company. And it seems to be that there's a, there's a bunch of different factors. One of them is the cost of electricity. One of them is the efficiency of the overall fleet. One of them is the hodl. Uh, one of them is something that's not really tied to anything quantitative. It's more of a qualitative. And, I, and I'd actually like to talk about that. And it's something you mentioned the other night, which I think is interesting and something that maybe isn't always taken into account. And that's these companies and these mining companies keeping their promises. Because you went through the other night a litany of companies who have said, hey, we're going to put three exahash online in a month. And then a year later, they've still only got one exahash online. And it's interesting to see how that is affecting public perception, but also just overall maybe perception of the industry as far as what you're talking about. You know, if you have this HPC and you've got 4 million predictably coming in, the unpredictability of maybe Bitcoin mining due to the volatility in price. And as you say, no one can tell me what the price of Bitcoin is going to be tomorrow. We can look historically and say, okay, the trend tells us, but is that going to continue to maybe make Bitcoin mining not only misunderstood, but potentially undervalued for most of the rest of the uh, you know, retail investment community? I think, I think the disconnect isn't between me and the retail investors. I think the disconnect is between institutional investors and everybody okay. else. 
Um, so, you know, I will do my analysis and not many people come back and say, you've got that wrong or I don't understand it. It's not, it's a lot of it's not, it's not rocket, overly rocket science. Um, there are some people out there that are trying to do, you know, do things in a, in a way, but it, it becomes too challenging for them to explain what they're trying to do. And, and to the average retail investor, you want to try and keep it fairly simple um, and explain things. And um, if you can do that, and, and and part of my my last role in the military, um, I was the senior warrant officer um, in charge of the of the school of accountancy. So I was teaching. So I you know I I understood um, in that posting, which was about two you know about two years my final posting there, teaching students, uh, at which fifteen years before that I was one of those students. So having the empathy to have gone through that facility and then being you know, basically in charge of the facility. Um, I could empathise with people coming through, know how it affected me and, and, and put that back to them and explain things in a way that they can understand it. And that's what I try to do to with the retail investment, not make it, you know, I, I think if anyone picked up my articles, they'd probably get a, a reasonably good understanding. I, I tend to, you know, if I put the metric down there, I tend to explain what the metric's trying to do. I don't just say, this is the you know, the utilisation metric, work it out for yourself. I'll actually put some words to it to sort of like, you know, maybe you might see it sometimes. Go, bloody hell, he's, gonna, he's put it again about the description about this bloody metric. And uh, so I, I do try to, try to you know, give that explanation out there. Um, but the, the I go back to the, um, you know, institutional investors, they want to see well-run businesses. They want to see businesses that have... Um, a real understanding of what the revenues, what the costs are going to be. And I just think there's a it's a challenge in this sector because we don't we don't know. We know what the we don't we know to a certain extent the cost because most of the you know energy cost is some have got fixed price, some have got market price. Um you've got some sort of like um understanding of, of that there. Your overhead costs are all your staffing costs and, and your GNA costs and they can be they're actually Pretty much fixed, irrespective of what else, every hour. You still have to pay your staff. You're still paying the travel bill when some of these C-suite guys go around doing these conferences every week. So you know what those bills are there in terms of flights and accommodation. You have legal fees. You have some professional fees. You have, you know admin fees. You've got site and site um, people on all your sites there. You know from managers down to support staff. So all those are fixed costs there. So they've got a handle on that there. The one thing they don't. Well, you could argue the energy is. Energy is linear with Bitcoin mining. So, you know, if they if they know they're going to run their machines and know what the energy cost is there, they've probably got an understanding of that there. But what they don't know is the Bitcoin price and therefore the revenues that are going to come in to meet those costs. And that's what institutions look at this space at the moment. And, you know, people look around to me and say, oh, but Anthony, the, the institutions are investing in these. Of course, we invest in the companies because they some of these companies are that big now that they're part of indexes that these institutional investors have to buy into anyway. So if an, in, if an institution buys the Russell 3000, they've already got four or five Bitcoin miners in that basket because they're in that, they have to buy all the stocks in Russell. You can't say, I'm going to buy the Russell 3000, but I just want those five stocks there because they're really good and I don't want the other you know, the other 2,995 stocks because I don't like them. You've got, you've got to, you buy all the stocks. So that's when miners start putting on, you know, when they go into a, a new indice, they'll promote that because they'll say, we've now reached the Russell 3000. I think the uh, Marathon Digital have just got into the S&P, is it 60 or 600 or whatever? You know, the, the, and, and, and that's an achievement to get into that because, again, Pension funds invest in these big stock indexes. And if you're in that group, your shares will be purchased. So there's retail mm. investors own most of these mining stocks. Um, I think Terrawolf has got probably the biggest insider holding of any of the mining stocks. So I think the insiders at Terrawolf own 40% of the company. So that's a significant amount there. Um, but generally... Even if you looked at Marathon, right, I think the retail investors have the bigger slice of the company than the institutional investors. And it all boils down to uncertainty. I think it boils down to a lot of it's got to be said what some of these people are paying themselves. Some people think they're um, CEOs of Apple and Amazon, and they're not. They're CEOs of mining companies. They're CEOs of companies that have been in an industry less than six years. So the oldest miners 
you know, Hive Digital is the oldest public miner. Write that down, Jarrett, because that's true. They've been going since 2017. That's the oldest miner. Um, some of these other miners have, have gone nowhere near that. Clean Spark's half that time. So, you know, um, so you're still in a, in a very new industry. And I think some of them, I don't know if some of them are in for the long term, short term. Um, it really it certainly worries me sometimes with the amount of stock compensation out there because they all pay themselves really well through salary and bonuses. Um, and, you know, I've used the analogy many times that, you know, I live, you know, two or three miles away from a from the eighth largest hospital in the UK. It's got 9,000 staff. The revenues for that hospital are a billion pounds a year. So about $1.3 billion of revenue a year that hospital brings in. So that's, you know... 10 times more than Marathon Digital brought in in the last year in Bitcoin mining or whatever it was. And um, they've got uh, a CEO there. There's 500,000 patients who are looked after by that hospital. And the CEO gets a salary of about $350,000 a year. And that would, I think every CEO in this mining space is paying themselves, you know, not just one times that, some are paying, you know, 10, 15 times that amount, you know, and it just... It just makes me sort of like, you know, wonder what what does that look from an institution who wants to, you know, take a position in some of these companies when, you know, they're investing so they get a return as well. And, you know, it just it just it just starts to worry me a little bit. Yeah, I, you said something similar to that the other night then, and I forget the exact CEO you've referenced, but that they got 20 something million in shares. But all that's to say that the, industry is growing and this is the compensation that I guess they feel uh, aligns with that growth. And I guess I want to go there over the next, you know, we've got two quarters left basically in 2024 and then we're going to get into 2025 where I think, and many other people in the Bitcoin community and Bitcoin mining community believe that we're going to see growth go through the roof. And a lot of that will be driven by a uh, Bitcoin price that we've never seen. And so you, as you look ahead, how are you thinking about you know, the future. And once again, not, let's not talk about price, but you know, let's talk about the things, you know, you've called out hive and you said that at the recently on, on the space. And I'll remember that 2017, you've talked about mining companies that have gone from 600 million to valuations of 4 billion seemingly overnight. If we've closed our eyes mm -hmm. quick enough. So where are we going and how big will this continue to be? And then I want to add the caveat on that. If you could touch upon this, this is almost seeming that it's too big to stop. I don't want to say it's a too big to fail situation like the banks, I'm using air quotes, but it almost feels like it's too big to stop. And so in the U.S. context, to not have policy that will align with the support of this growth could be super detrimental, not only to you know the pension funds you're talking about that are now including some of these stocks, but just the overall profile of the growth of the United States. And once again, I know you're in the UK, but these companies, you know, obviously okay. are stateside. They're all, they're all stateside. So if you could talk about the growth and then if you think we're – we're, we're at a point or whether we're going to get to a point where this is almost too big for the U S from a policy and regulation standpoint to kind of, you know, shake a stick at. Um, the, 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 the growth is going to, you know, ex be excessive this next 24 months. So, you know, by the end of 2025, at the moment, you've only got one or one or two mining companies that are over 20 X hash in terms of self mining. So you've got marathon digital and, and uh, core scientific are over 20 X hash. But by the end of this year, you're going to have five or six miners in that in that position there. So so I just looked at um, uh, to just today actually I looked at you know five of the of the miners that have got the big growth this year are going to add a hundred exahash to the global hash rate. So the global hash rate today is six hundred exahash. That global hash rate will increase by twenty percent based on today's hash rate just by five companies. Um, now. Where does it stop? Um, as long as the rewards and the transaction fees make it viable for miners to keep mining, it will it will continue. Um, we had the rally in transaction fees post the halving, and that was really welcomed um, in, the, in those two or three days. In fact, um, some of the mining companies, or most of the mining companies, would have been earning significantly more the day post the halving than the day before the halving. Um, Core Scientific will be an example of that. And they mine, 
I think the three days before the halving, they were mining 30 Bitcoin a day. And they, with regularity, they do exactly what it says on the tin. This is the hash rate. That's what they deliver. They've never had any problem with production. Month in, month out, they, they're the, in terms of the biggest miner, they've mined the most Bitcoin in 2021, 2022, 2023, and the first quarter of 2024. So no one's competed with them in, the, in that period at all, not even Marathon. Um, the day after the halving, they mined 57 Bitcoin. Now, they should have mined 15 because natural common sense, if your 30 becomes halved, you're only going to mine 15 Bitcoin. Now, the Bitcoin rewards post the halving were, were, would have been 15, but the transaction fees that were given to, to, to some of those blocks were phenomenal. We had a spike, you know, the hash, the hash price, which looks have put together, the hash price went from, it was 110 before the halving. It should have dropped down to 55, and it did drop initially. It did drop. Then a few hours after the halving, it came down. It was heading towards 70, down towards 60. And all of a sudden, it turned around and went to 180. And, um, you know, this, you know, we, we, you know, we explain, you know, the reasons why. this. So the transaction fees, you know, are really important for the mine, miners as well. If, if, if the rewards will continue to reduce every four years, every halving, it, you know, there's less rewards. So they're reliant on two things. They're reliant on the Bitcoin price, compensating them for the, the change. So there'll be an expectation post halving now that the Bitcoin price does rally. And in every previous cycle, it has rallied significantly around about months four and five post the halving. It's rallied, you know, and, and got to that position where they're in the same revenue position they were prior to the halving. So it's compensating them for the lack of rewards. The Bitcoin price makes up for it. Um, and and if you think about this, this halving, this halving is probably different from every other halving. The fact that we've got 11 um, spot ETFs that were approved in January in the US that have attracted absolute unprecedented um, purchases of Bitcoin. I mean, you know, that the amount of Bitcoin if you look at this, the, I think you can compare this to the gold ETF when that was approved. Bitcoin did in two months what the gold ETF took two years to do in terms of people investing in those ETF stocks. That puts you in a, you know, um, and once we get further adoption, um, you know, at the moment, you know, I, I always use the analogy that Bitcoin is at the iPhone 3 stage at the moment, whereas iPhone's really at iPhone 15. So in terms of adoption terms, we're still early. Um, if we talk about future price and you've articulated that, and there is an expectation, the price goes up. What the mining companies need to realise is not just um, they're going to be switching on with the price going up. Everybody's going to be switching on because if the price goes up significantly and it bursts up there, all those miners that were switched off because it wasn't profitable to mine might now be profitable to mine so the hash rate goes up the difficulty comes down because it's compensated then so these mining companies who've built up the hash rate then start not not getting the production they were expecting because everybody's mining the global hash rate's big so you know if you were to say to me Anthony the global hash rate will remain at 600 exa hash for the next two years and the price is going to go up to 200,000. I could calculate it very quickly what the sort of revenues will be like for these companies, but you can't you can't tell me two things. You can't tell me the Bitcoin price is going to go to 200,000 and you can't tell me what the global hash rate is going to be. And those are two big, big variables. And then add another variable into that. What's the price of power going to be? I mean, two years ago in 2022, when we had uh, Russia invade Ukraine, the cost of power around the world just exploded. I mean, you know, we're sat in the UK. Power prices have come down a little bit now, but we're still paying something like about 30 cents a kilowatt hour here for our domestic supply. And I mean, could you imagine a mining company coming to the, trying to mine it? That's why we don't have many miners in the UK. We do have a couple, but they're using methane. So they're using um, converted methane into energy. And I, I know that they're it's costing about seven and a half pence um, you know, in terms of the, the cost of delivering that power. So, you know, they're able to sort of like, you know, s switch on if they've got really good, efficient machines. They might be able to switch on and make a profit. But seven and a half cents in the US is just not it's just not manageable. You know, 
Um, even the hosted miners, so Bit Digital and Marathon Digital both have significant hosting in their portfolios. Bit Digital has all their miners hosted, and Marathon's got probably 45% of its miners hosted now that it's bought some sites. The hosting fee with the energy fee that they're paying at the moment, around about six and a half cents. That's with a hosting fee. And if you look at their results, uh, look at Marathon's results, because they haven't got anything apart from um, really the, the, the self-mining. If you took that, um, that, that big gain they got from the uh, valuation of Bitcoin, it, 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 they made a net loss in terms of um, not not cash flow. So they, they, they had a free cash flow position, but the, the, they had a net loss because once you start taking into account depreciation, stock compensation, by the, by the way, they, they they paid 50 million of stock compensation in, uh, or, or, or sorry, uh, awarded 50 million of stock compensation in that first quarter of 2024. So that's a, that's a, you know, I mean, it's just, a, that's just one quarter. That's not the whole year. They've got three quarters to go yet. I'm looking forward to seeing what quarter two is going to look like. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, in one way, you know, it, it's going to be great. But in, in another way, people need to realise Bitcoin price rises to 200,000. There'll be more miners going onto the network because everyone will think it'd be really profitable to mine then. Um, there seems to be no bottleneck in buying miners at the moment. So Bitmain, MicroBT, Canaan, the big three are able to produce miners. They're all bringing out more efficient miners as we speak. So if you go to these minor conferences, um, Bitmain do them quite regularly. Um, you know, they brought out the S21 Pro. Um, I've got friends in Dubai at the moment. That there was a, there was a conference out there not too last month, I think it was, and there was even talk then that the, the there's going to be another model coming out towards the end of this this year that'll beat the S21 Pro. I think they're getting it down to twelve joules. Then you've got the likes of Bitdeer, who are starting to manufacture their own machines, and their first their first stab at this. I mean, you know, they're you know they're a mining company, been self mining for a few years now. They've got a big hosting business, big managed service businesses. Their first model was eighteen point one joules of terahash. Now, in terms of um, in terms of how good that is, that's as good as Canard's latest model. They've just announced their latest model at eighteen point one or eighteen point two joules of terahash. That's their latest model, and that and they've been at they're recognised uh, they're a recognised uh, manufacturer. You know, Bitmains is at fifteen with the S twenty one Pro. The T21 and the S21's normal versions are, are actually, you know, on a par with the the first generation model that um, that that Bitdeer brought out. So, what does Bitdeer's second generation model look like when they bring that one out? I mean, this is frightening. Um, Block are bringing out a, a Bitcoin miner this year. That'll be interesting. So, there are new entrants to the market to bring out these more efficient machines, and if they can get the manufacturing side of it. it's all it's all right bringing out a few machines to test and say to the market we've created something um, bear in mind bit deer have got 50 guys in the r d department so bit deer have got more people working in r d than marathon have got in employees at the moment so you know that that there's an understanding why bit deer have done this gone down this route in-house and if you think about bit deer bit deer ceo was the co-founder of bitmain so it's not a big it's not a big link to work out why they can start manufacturing. I mean, you know, Bitdeer came out of Bitmain, and I would imagine some of those R and D employees were from the Bitmain um, organization, and maybe some of them have got some secret source hidden away in in boxes that they've um, they've been able to sort of like put together. And um, you know, I say for a first stab, eighteen point one joules. They're predominantly going to build machines for themselves, but. You know, if the opportunity arises with the uh, machines going anywhere like they did in 2021. So in 2021, Jared, people were paying $80 a terahash for S19s. Now, all these big miners are saying $14, $15, $16 for the S21 Pros. This is the latest model. At them sort of prices, a, a, a fifth of 20% of the price. If the prices start to increase, Bitdeer has said, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll build more and sell them. That's a revenue stream for us. So initially, they're going to use them for themselves, grow their hash rate internally. But if the market determines that actually there's growth out there, the Bitcoin price rallies to all these magical numbers that everyone's coming out with, and you know we'll all you know we'll all be happy. I'd be happy at two hundred thousand. I really would be happy at two hundred thousand. Bear in mind, there was a guy. Was he called Plan B? Plan, B. Plan B. Yep. 
Plan B. B. Right, 2021, Plan B. Everyone was following Plan B. Got one of the biggest followings on YouTube. You know, we're talking Michael Saylor-esque in terms of, you know, followers. Yeah. Like, and Yeah, it was, it was his... Stock-to-flow uh, flow diagram. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to say that. Yep. <laughs> and we were all waiting. We were all waiting. We basically breathed at 100,000, weren't we? It was all on... Everything was on track to 100,000. It got to 69 and, and turned. And then from 69, it went down to 15. Now, in... in his, his flow diagram has actually been really good for the last, you know, for the, for the he's not just started, he's been doing it quite a few years now and actually still thinks it's on track to get where it needs to be, you know. But I just, just you know, people need to manage expectation a little bit as well. Um, I think, I think you know, we're in a different space than we were in 2021. These ETFs are changing the landscape. Apparently, I read a few weeks ago, 44 million Americans have got crypto. Yeah, that's the number that floats around. I think that that yeah. comes from some of the Coinbase research. Coinbase has probably got some of the best research around U.S. Probably got, probably got most of the account holders as well. <laughs> it, it's going to be interesting to see, but I think that maybe that's a good pivot point because this hopefully won't be the last time that you join us. Your information yeah. is amazing. It's super insightful and it's been great to have you. But I think that that was a really poignant thing to say. Let's manage expectations, both in the mining industry at Bitcoin and large. And then just, you know, as we move forward into the future, um, I, I want to thank you for hopping on. And for anyone watching, please follow us on the podcast or subscribe on YouTube. You can find us on social media on X or Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube at Compass Mining. Anthony, this has been great. Like I said, hopefully you come back on. Maybe we could do a quarterly thing and just talk yep. about some of the earnings. And I'm going to leave some of your most recent articles below. Um, by the time this comes out, and I'm going to spill the beans here, your new website will be up. So I will put your power mining analysis website as well as your LinkedIn and Twitter in the um, you know episode description I'll send, for people I'll send to find I'll send you. The new link to you for the new website. Yeah, but yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for joining. And I, I look forward to finally, hopefully meeting you IRL in Nashville. Excellent. Look forward to it.